Okay, so in the wake of the new Tudor Black Bay Ceramic, there's a lot of excitement about the brand. There's been a lot of Black Bays released that people have liked, and now this one has just been the icing on the cake. That's led to a lot of pretty fanciful and far-fetched talk of Tudor sort of challenging Omega. Now, don't get me wrong, I really like this new Black Bay Ceramic. I think it is definitely a statement of intent, for Tudor to improve, to move up that league table. But the idea that they're even in the same ballpark as Omega right now is, frankly, laughable. I'll show you some numbers, do some comparisons, and show you why, as I said, comparing Tudor and Omega right now is just a little bit silly. Okay, so anyone who's watched my channel at all will know that I always like to start with numbers. Numbers are not everything, but they are always a great place to start in trying to form and then support some kind of opinion. So I'm going to start with the numbers here from the Morgan and Stanley research that came out earlier in the year. Can I be, can you be, can we be certain that these are absolutely accurate? No, of course we can't, but they are pretty much the best we've got. They're the only numbers we've got. And But from here, you can begin asking yourself the question and potentially answering the question, who is Tudor really? And I personally think that the best way of starting there, starting that question is with the prices. Okay, so in trying to position the various brands by price, I'm going to start with Omega. They are the hunted in this little model, that, this little game we're playing. And they come in, I think it's not going to be controversial to call them a mid-level brand. They're mid-level with an average price per piece sold of 5,626 Swiss francs. I'll define entry level. I won't go all the way down to Tiso or Longines. Let's define entry level. Let's include TAG at this level. And they're selling each and every watch they can at 2,391 Swiss francs. For shits and giggles, and because I'm a Breitling fan, you look at the price they sell each of their pieces for, it's remarkably close to Omega within a cup within what four hundred dollars at fifty two hundred and fifty four Swiss francs per Breitling watch sold. Now, where do you think Tudor is gonna fit in this slide? I suppose that big empty space is giving you some clues, and sure enough, they're down there with tag with an average price per Tudor sold of 2,754 Swiss francs. That is a gap of 2,872 Swiss francs per watch. Another way of putting it is it is a 104% difference between your average everyday Tudor and your average everyday Omega. Okay, so that's looking at big picture numbers and averages. Let's look a little deeper and start looking at what that means in terms of watches. So we'll start with the entry level, and this is the entry level Tudor. This is the first watch off the rank that you can buy. Um, this is the 1926, very simple, dress, dressish, sportish kind of watch, steel on a leather band, ETA movement coming in at $2,500. I should stress all the prices you're about to see are Australian dollars. I haven't converted them to Swiss francs. It doesn't matter. Just roll with it. Let's look at the entry level Omega now. The entry level Omega, the cheapest Omega I could find was the Omega Seamaster. Yes, this is the cheapest Omega watch I could find on the Omega website. Another way, another thing to bear in mind is that the cheapest Omega that we're looking at here is three times the price of the cheapest Tudor. 
Okay, so that's at the bottom end. How about we have some fun and go play at the very top end? Okay, so at the very top of the Tudor tree, you have the Black Bay 58 18K, 22,880 Australian dollars worth of gold and Tudor movement. This is the most expensive Tudor you can buy. What about the most expensive Omega you can get your hands on? Well, actually, there's a couple around this price range. I chose my favorite, which would be the DeVille, DeVille Turbion Coaxial Chronometer Numbered Edition. Sedna Gold on a leather strap, yours for a tidy $227,225 Australian dollars. That is not cheap. For those of you who aren't keeping track, that is exactly 10 times the price of the most expensive Tudor you can get. So, put that in perspective, the cheapest Omega is currently three times the price of the cheapest uh, Tudor, and the most expensive Omega is approximately 10 times the price of the most expensive Tudor. What if we go right back to those uh, Morgan and Stanley numbers and go to the average prices? What watches would you get sitting right on those averages? Now, you'll note in doing this, I've done a little bit of a conversion from Swiss francs to Australian dollars. So if you're wondering why the numbers don't quite line up, that's what it is. But trust me, we're good enough for government work here. Okay, so your average tutor that sits right on the Morgan and Stanley number is pretty much your bog standard ETA powered 36 millimeter Black Bay 36 on a bracelet. 4,000 Aussie dollars, it's pretty much line ball with the 2,700 Swiss francs that Morgan and Stanley gave us. That is your average tutor. Conversely, your average Omega is the Seamaster Aquaterra coaxial master chronometer, in-house movement, Metas certified, steel on steel, at, and a steel at 8750 Australian dollars. That is the average Omega stole. So with those watches in mind, with those ideas in mind, let's go back to this question of can Tudor close that gap to Omega? Can they close the 2,872 Swiss franc difference per watch required to approach Omega? And can they do so tearing themselves away from TAG? And the reason why I bring TAG into the, the mix here is TAG's high-end watches are as good as Tudor's high-end watches. TAG's high-end watches, like Tudor, challenge Omega. What holds TAG back isn't the quality of their good stuff, it's the quality of their poor stuff. That could be an issue for Tudor as well. Remember those 1826s we looked at earlier? If Tudor keeps selling those, can they close that value gap? And before we go on, I should go back to those initial numbers because there is something I've skipped over in all of this discussion about having to sell for Tudor, having to sell their watches at twice the price. It's not just that. For Tudor to challenge Omega, they have to sell twice as many watches as they do now, also at twice the price. Hence that my question before about how do they do that if they're still selling $2,500, $3,000 Australian watches? Is it viable for them to even have them in the catalog if they want to start getting up around Omega levels? Now, I know a lot of you are going to find those tables and charts really boring and dry and not really particularly engaging. So let's finish this up with a picture a picture that I think really sums up the true sort of relative positions of Tudor and Omega. The new Black Bay Ceramic is a great watch. It is certainly one of my favorites, and a lot of people are using this as a basis for explaining how well Tudor is doing and where they're going. It is right now, with the exception of a gold piece, probably their Halo product. And it is going into battle against 
the cheapest watch Omega sells. It is going, it's Tudor's Halo product is jumping into the ring and duking it out with the entry-level model into the Omega range. I don't think any picture, I don't think any way of expressing this shows the relative positions of Tudor and Omega better than this simple diagram. So that's it. That's how far I think the chasm is between Tudor and Omega. That is the size of the mountain that Tudor must climb. Now, I'm not saying they can't do it. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if they get very, very close in a decade or two. And that's what we're looking at. Earlier, I spoke about what it would take for Omega to challenge Rolex. And I gave myself 10 to 15 years minimum for that to occur. I think the gap between Tudor and Omega is even bigger. I think that that would take a minimum of 10 years, but we're probably looking at 20 years and may require a fundamental overhaul of at least two thirds to three quarters, not just an overhaul, a complete dumping of two thirds to three quarters of the current Tudor catalog if they're going to move forward. There's, this is not a fait accompli. This is certainly not going to happen in the near future. And I'm curious to know what you guys think. I've been Pete McConville. This is Not So Obvious Watchers, and I'll speak to you later. Bye.